Welcome to the Watering Hole Podcast. I'm your host, Mary Riemann. The Watering Hole is a place to come and quench your thirst for meaning, nourish your hunger for inspiration, and feed your need for connection. Featuring inspirational talks, curious conversations, mystical meditations, and other artistic expressions exploring themes on life, spirituality, nature, mystery, and so much more. So meet me at the watering hole, and together, let's drink from deep waters. I invite you to join your intentions with mine, that the meditations of my heart and the words of my mouth might hold for each of us a blessing, a word of comfort, a word of challenge, a word of growth. May we have ears to hear and hearts to receive the message that is for us this day. Blessed be. There is a basic urgency in life to grow, to expand, to become new and renewed. We might even say that the very meaning of life and death is to be constantly in the process of becoming a new creation. This urgency is what Brian Swim calls allurement, gravitation, the power of attraction that pervades the universe. In theology, we call it holy longing. In fact, there was a Hindi proverb that a friend had at her vacation home that I visited quite often. Um, that's, it was a Hindi proverb, and it said, that which you seek is causing you to seek. Right? It sort of gets at what Simone Wheel said. At the center of the human heart is the longing for an absolute good. Longing is universal and it's primal and it is a catalyst for creation. So this morning I kind of want to unpack that video we heard. So as Brian Swim, a cosmologist, says, you know, you think about hydrogen and helium being in this cloud and they're responding to a gravitational pull and attraction. Well, we're like those atoms. We get pulled towards people and things and places, and we don't know why. We don't know why we're attracted to such things. Think about the music you listen to, right? Sometimes the music you listen to might be, might not resonate with me, right? I mean, sorry, I wish LT was here today, because I would, I, my, my mind went right to LT, because he listens to some shit, and I'm like, I, I, don't, I don't know what they're saying, LT, and the sound is not bringing me closer to myself, so. Uh, but it does him. It does, it does for him, right? We don't know why we're drawn to such things, why some things resonate and some don't. So, but when we respond to those things, something happens. Right? They change us. They open us. They move us. So, you know, I don't know why. I don't know why I was drawn to theology, to God stuff when I was a kid, but I'll tell you what, I don't remember a time not being consumed by it. I do not remember a time when I was not consumed by it. Every choice, not every, probably most choices I've made in my life have been a result of that longing, that longing to know, that longing for communion, that longing to experience whatever the hunger is in myself that says there's got to be something more. And it brought me here. Whoa. I mean, when he says that our longings or our allurements are our future creative work, expressing themselves in the presence, that shit blew my mind. I was like, oh my God. And then I started looking back at my life. And I, and he's right. I was like, wow, my longing has been the vessel of my becoming. It has brought me to this place. I mean, I think about it, you know, many of you know this story, but when I was a kid, Every chance I got, I went into the open church because churches used to be unlocked in the 70s. 
And then in the church I grew up in, it was a huge church, and it had four wings, and in the center it had six huge round steps. At the, like, I realized this, well, last night it occurred to me when I was tossing and turning, uh, that it was sort of like a wedding cake, which maybe is what it was meant to be, right? Because then the priest took his, his place, and the priest was the spouse of the church, of Christ. Well, we, the altar that we had as I was growing up was like a wood wood block, and it had this little arch cut out of it, and uh, I would just go and sit under there, the top of that altar, and I would go there and listen. I would go there to be quiet. I would go there because I didn't know what to do with this ache that was in my heart that I couldn't figure out how to satisfy it. And consequently, that led me to so many other things, right? So by releasing ourselves into our longing, Swim says, into our attraction, we enter into a process of creativity. We encounter other people, other experiences, subjects of interests, and we get fired up. Our passions get fired up. Our energy gets fired up. Our curiosity gets fired up. And we start to look into things, and we start to move towards things and explore them. Maybe it's a person. Think how you change, how we've changed because of the people that have been in our lives. When my dad got married after, he got married two years after my mom died, and I'll never forget, we're on the phone, and he's, he's all excited telling me about his, his new woman. And he says something about, yeah, she does yoga. I think I might do yoga. And I was like, <laughs> I'm like, you know, I was like, okay, cool, Dad, that's awesome, you know. Uh, but, you know, it's totally out of the character of the dad I knew. Well, right, because we change. When we meet different people, they bring out different interests in us. They, they call us to explore new possibilities. Lo and behold, my dad's doing yoga these days. So those attractions, those relationships... Uh, Teilhard de Chardin called them creative unions, right? When we enter into them, we, there's the potential for us to become something entirely new. Like the, the helium and the hydrogen, when they fused, became the guts of the star. Think about oxygen and hydrogen, and when they come together, they create water, something entirely beyond what either one of them could do by themselves. Our longings draw us. They are that, uh, that force of attraction that move us in a direction. And they may even be moving us, if we listen to them, to our vocation. In fact, uh, Beatrice Bruto was a theologian. She's dead now, but she studied the work of Teilhard intimately. And she suggested that we are in a very uh, precarious time. I think we all kind of feel that. And she said, the, but the, the hope is, is that humans have the consciousness to decide to come into union, to pursue these creative unions, to bring forth something new. But if we're going to do that, that means that we've got to be willing to sort of share our essential energy, our essential excitement. We've got to be willing to share our passions. Because when we do, you never know. It's like Flint. You never know when you bring them to a person. Man, if they might say something that sparks the fire, that takes that passion to the next level. That's hopeful. You guys, that is so hopeful. Because that means that we can change, and it means that we can impact the world, and we are, in fact, impacting the world. The problem is, is our culture doesn't know what to do with this sense of longing. We, we don't know how to follow it rather than feed it, and I'm as guilty as anyone. I mean, I'm not standing here telling you that, you know, I follow my longing and it's made everything easy. That's not the point either. It's not the point either. But think about it. Longing is an ache. It's sort of a pain, right? 
And so we go to great lengths to satisfy that, that hunger, to satisfy it. The problem is, is that we often satisfy it with things that are not nutritional, <laughs> that don't have nutritional value for our souls, right? It's sort of like, you know, sugar addiction, which I can totally talk about because that's, you know, that's one of mine. Comes and goes because depending on my ability to refrain. Uh, but, you know, the more you eat the sugar, the more you want the sugar. And yet your body still hungers for real, real food. Right? Well, the same is with our souls, with our inner being. It's hungering for something and it has the potential to take us somewhere if we listen to it. But oftentimes we feed it instead of listening to it, instead of following it. So, you know, like I, th I think about, um, I've talked about this before. There's an enormous number of people addicted to pornography right now. And, uh, and sort of empty sexual encounters. Well, I think that the, the draw to that is really this desire to feed the ache for belonging, to feed the ache for connection, to feed the ache for eros, for love. But if we don't feed it with the real thing, we just end up feeling bad that we haven't satisfied the longing or pursued the longing or followed it where it wants us to take us. And so we just exacerbate our discontent. And frankly, we don't create anything in those experiences of lasting value. But when we follow our longing, our allurements, it's leading us to that deeper awareness that there's more to life than what meets the eye. When I was younger and I was in spiritual direction, well, I'm, I still have the same spiritual director, but I was exploring Buddhism a lot and there was this idea, you know, in Buddhism that, it, you know, sort of letting go of your desires and uh, be satisfied with what you have instead of wishing for what you don't have. And so I bring this to my spiritual director and I'm talking to her about it. And she's so damn practical. I mean, she was always like rolling her eyes at some shit. And so I sit down with her and I'm telling her this and, and talking about it and her response totally surprised me. I don't know why, by, especially by then. But um, she was like, I think there could be a benefit to your dissatisfaction. I think your hunger might be telling you something. I think it might be a longing. And so we started calling that longing the hunger factor. And she was basically like, I don't think you should discount the hunger factor because it's that hunger that makes you keep seeking, that makes you keep exploring, that takes you on more adventures, that may be actually leading you to what you're supposed to do or the a subject you're supposed to come upon, right? And so from there on out, we kept calling it the hunger factor. And I kept coming back to it. And I started to realize that my dissatisfaction is a longing and that I can actually cultivate the ability to stay with it, right? And when we have the ability to stay with it, when we can stay with the absence right cuz it's not it's not easy there is an absence that we feel when we can stay with that absence we open ourselves up to the possibility of encountering mystery in a way that leads us to the right place the right people the right time and opportunities emerge because we're alert we're attentive to what our longing is trying to communicate that that which we are seeking is seeking us, is calling us, right? So the impetus to feed rather than follow our longing, I think, has created a narcissistic culture that relies on instant gratification to numb the pangs that could otherwise lead us to discover our depths, our passion, and our potential. 
Longing is the siren of the seeker calling us, right? Rumi said it, it this longing is really uh, the seed to most, if not all, of Rumi's poetry. But one of the ways he articulated is he said this, crying out loud and weeping are great resources. A nursing mother, all she does is wait to hear her child, just a little beginning whimper, and she's there. God created the child that is your wanting, your longing, so that it might cry out, so that milk might come. He said, cry out. Don't be stolid and silent with your longing. Lament and, the mil and let the milk of loving flow into you. The milk of loving comes when we pursue our longing, when we pursue those things and those people and those places that attract us. I mean, think about it. That's the beginning of love. It's attraction. That is the beginning of love. It is being smitten, being curious, following that uh, draw to get to know a person. That's allurement. That's longing, longing. Oh, I got slides. I forgot. Joan Chittister su suggests that we can either, our longings can either expand us or narrow our horizons. Expand our horizons or narrow or our, our whew. let's try that again. Narrow our horizons. It's a lot of oars in there. Um, and that's the thing, right? That's the thing about addiction. Addiction narrows our horizon. Addictions, no matter what they are, they're signs that we're trying to feed a deeper longing, a holy longing, with something superficial. And so instead of maybe giving into them, maybe they are a call, a bell, calling us to mindfulness, calling us to say, oh, this is my hunger for something more. My God, maybe we could celebrate them, <laughs> right? Instead of trying to just squash them, let, you know, as you're sitting there, I mean, my girl smokes her cigs, does whatever. What if we started to look at them as signs that can lead us into our hunger more deeply? But that means we've got to allow ourselves to feel the wanting, to feel the craving, and not fill it, but follow it. So, you know, as Swim said, each person discovers their own field of allurements. We all have our own longings. The beauty is, is that as we pursue them, they p call out of us our gifts, our talents, things that we didn't even know we had, potential, capabilities, capacities. And so as we pursue them, we start to connect with other people, with other things, with new landscapes. And we become new ourselves. And maybe those people become new, and those places we visit become new. Because we're bringing something essential to them. So he's right. Our longings are sacred. They need to be protected. They need to be celebrated. They need to be blessed, sanctified, because they are the calling of our future in the present. They are reminding us of our creative capacity. They are reminding us that we are connected to all that is from the beginning of time, from the time before time to now. And that same yearning, that same longing that makes a star burst with light is the same longing that makes us burst with light. It's the same longing that takes us to those people, to those events, to those unions that call forth something bigger than we even know we are capable of reaching, of being. 
the great mystery is that we have longing at all, that we are interested in, attracted to anything whatsoever, because that is where love begins, to become fascinated, to feel allurement, to pursue our longings is to step into a wild love affair on any level of life, as Swim insists, by pursuing our allurements, we bind the universe together. The unity of the world rests on our pursuit of passion. And in a world or a culture that values money over meaning and profit over passion, it takes a lot of strength, a lot of willingness, a lot of support to follow our passions, especially when they don't make sense to anyone else, right? I remember getting a Bible and going into my room and starting to read it. And, you know, I grew up Catholic, and we weren't supposed to have our own Bibles. And my mom walked down the hall, and she saw me in my room, and she was pissed. And she walked by, and she slammed the door. She didn't understand. She could not understand. Thank God I didn't stop, because here I am. So don't stop. Pursue your passions even when they don't make sense to anyone else. The world needs us to do this. It's what is going to bring the giftedness of a new generation of potential for healing this up world that we are part of right now. So find it. Do whatever you got to do to discover it and sit with your longing. Sit with it and let it lead you. Follow it because there's a star waiting to be born and it's you. Thanks for listening, everybody. I look forward to meeting you right back here at the watering hole. And as Mary Oliver said, go easy, be filled with light, and shine.